Welcome everyone to our session, Women Explorers, what does the future of mainframe development look like? So my name is Rochelle Ann Groff, and I'm a senior software engineer from Broadcom. And today I will be the moderator. I'll be moderating this discussion with four other women technologists on mainframe modernization and collaboration on an open community. Today, I want you all to meet the women of the Zoe Explorer squad. So we have, Jessilene Punambaya. Jessilene is a product marketing engineer from Broadcom. We have Lauren Lee. Lauren is a front end developer from IBM. We have Billy Jean Simmons. Billy is a software engineer from IBM. And we have Caitlin Ninabel. Caitlin is a software engineer formerly from Broadcom. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So I want to start with what might be some jarring statistics for our discussion today. So based on a 2021 study by the anitab.org Institute, the overall representation of women technologists decreased by 2.1 percentage points between March 2020 and January 2021 to just 26.7%. And aside from that, representation of tech women decreased at all levels except for intern in 2021. So in light of these numbers and in light of these statistics, I would like to turn to our panelists and ask each of you to describe a little bit about yourselves and describe your journey to Zoe Explorer and whether you had enough women representation in your career, in your school, if you had women mentors, and, and how did you arrive to, to the project of Zoe Explorer? So I want to start with Lauren. Sure. So Zoe Explorer is actually my first open source project. And my journey into the Zoe Explorer was definitely not a straight path. I actually started in the healthcare field. And then um, over there, women outnumbered men in both my classes and my workplace. But I got interested in the health information systems that were being used and the technology behind them. And so my angle of approach into programming was more from like an informatics or information science perspective rather than like a hardcore computer science approach. And then in my master's degree program, which was in information science, there was a lot of focus on not just like how to program and code, but also facets like user experience design and also things like what is the impact of the technologies and the, the disparities in information access on the community. And so in my program, I'd actually say there's more women than men in my class. And so I didn't have any shortage of women colleagues or mentors there. Um, and then when I joined IBM after I graduated, the team for our project, which works on Zoe Explorer, was still kind of forming. And originally the distribution was more skewed towards having more men than women. But then after the team kind of filled out in the next few months, um, the dis distribution kind of evened out. And now I feel like it's more equal but I also feel like I've been really lucky in that even when the distribution wasn't so even, um, I don't feel like it got in the way of me being able to contribute to the team or in the way of my personal or career development. I feel like I've had a lot of great mentors uh, and role models here and both men and women. And I feel like, you know, the teammates treat each other with respect regardless of their appearance or background. Great. So let's go to Billy. What about you? How's your journey to Zoe Explorer? Hey, um, my journey to Zoe Explorer was pretty much started when I joined IBM about three and a half years ago. I joined up and was working with the beta team that first designed Zoe. And from there, you know, my squad and IBM was formed. And when Zoe Explorer was introduced, we were brought on to work on that being, and was also my first open source project. So like Lauren mentioned, you know, we're on the same team there at IBM and it's it's pretty even team between women and men and everybody is very respectful. And I enjoy working with everybody and working on the Zoe Explorer squad. So in your university class, it was 
it was even as well for you? Is that the same experience that Lauren had? had? With the university, when I first started out, I was the only woman in the class. But, you know, as I went along and through the years before graduation, it, it started evening out more. So it seems like more women in tech were starting to join the further I went along. It's great to hear. How about you, Caitlin? How's your, how did you get started with Zoic Spar? Um, okay, so I guess I'll start with college as well. Um, I studied mathematics in college. And I went to a pretty small college, so uh, our class had maybe like 10 people in the graduating group. And it was a little bit uh, less women, more guys, but it was about, it was about evenly spaced. Um, and then I, I sort of realized like two thirds of the way through college that, you know, programming was really for me. And so I started taking a bunch of programming classes, which were also, you know, more guys than, than girls, probably more students in general. Maybe we had 50 people in that class and maybe 30 of them were girls. And then I finished at a uh, university. I moved to Prague and I got my first job here, which was not Broadcom. It was at another company and it was just me and one other girl and everybody else was guys. Um, that was more of like an engineering field and we were both doing software, uh, sort of um, the work was designing plants that produced flour, uh, you know, like cooking flour and we were the only two girls on the group and all of the guys, I think mostly that was because the guys were going on commissioning. So they would travel to all sorts of places all over the world. And uh, some of those places just doesn't really make sense to send a girl. I mean, they're going to Saudi Arabia and places in the Middle East. Um, so yeah, uh, I stopped working there, uh, partially because I didn't feel like I could really move further in the programming field. Uh, not because I was a girl or anything, but because they were doing a different kind of programming than I know how to do. So I switched to Broadcom. And Broadcom was really, really evenly spaced. I feel like our team is, is pretty well split, uh, especially maybe more while I was there. I know that two guys joined after, after I left um, and everything, you know, was fine there uh, socially. And at my current position, I'm still pretty new there. So figuring out the, the number of people on the team is, is still unsure because we're all working from home. But it's, again, two chicks and I think maybe, I don't know, maybe... 20 to 30 people on the team total maybe no it's got to be less it's more like 15 to 20 so that's that's roughly the split and is zoe your first open source collaboration as well i believe so yes mm -hmm. cool. what about you jelly what's your experience like well for me um i believe normally in asia the split between women and men are kind of equal. I, I don't know, but when I started in university or, or in college, my, I, I graduated as a computer science um, with a computer science degree, and my classmates are, I, I feel like it's evenly spaced. If it's if it's not, then I, I'm very bad at noticing these things. Um, and then when I joined uh, the, a local bank in the Philippines after graduating, uh, I believe the mainframe department has more women. So I would say it's a 60, 40% in overall mainframe department. So it was kind of nice because you have, let's say, a balance between um, genders. But when I moved to Europe, uh, start when I started moving to Borno in Czech Republic, then I noticed that there's a big difference in women and men um, as part of one organization. So I start I I work in Czech Republic as a support. So I have let's say from the from the Philippines going to the Czech Republic, I'm an application developer, mainly focusing on COBOL. But then I switched to um, system system administrator in Czech Republic, and, and there I would. I could see that there are a lot of men, especially in the system, system admin part. And most of the time, most of the men that I've worked with are from the L1 support. So these are the people who are working from night shift and stuff. And normally we're split into four shifts. And per shift, we have one female. And I'm the female in, in, in that shift, or I'm the woman in that, in that shift. And then I went to Broadcom. I am very fortunate enough to be part of, or, or my every team that I've joined, we have, let's say, more women 
um, in the team, maybe because I've been partnered with Risha. So at least there's two women into the team. Every time I switch to a different team. And then when I joined Zoe, I, Caitlin was there. And then the Zoe Explorer squad also has wonderful women there. So I'm very, very fortunate. But if I look, let's say, if I zoom out and check the organization itself or the value stream that we have, there's definitely less women than than men in comparison. So I've heard that a variety of stories going to Zoe Explorer, and some of you have less experience in mainframe than, than others. So let's maybe go to Lauren or Caitlin to, to explain your first um, experience with working on the mainframe and um, what it does and yeah, before being exposed to it via Zoe Explorer. Uh, Lauren, go, go ahead. Sure. So um, as I had been introduced by Rochelle, um, I'm a front end developer, which means I work a lot with like the graphical user interfaces, web uh, interfaces, and that was what a lot of my schooling was in. So once I got into IBM, that was my first exposure to mainframes. And for me, it was like a really big um, change. Our interface was the TN or the 3270 emulator and um, also known as the green screen. It's very text-based and it's completely different from what I was used to working with. Um, I had a lot of trouble adjusting to it and even now I'm still kind of shaky with it. So um, for me, working on a product that is made to help newcomers um, or, you know, designed with newcomers in mind to help them get started with mainframe development has been um, helpful for me as well for getting it more familiar with mainframe application development and the ins and outs of that. Yeah, I think I think that was nice for me as well that I got to work on something that was going to help new people come in. Um, plus, we got so much we got so much feedback from the master of the mainframe course that that was really cool because um, we were having you know trouble getting feedback on on what we were doing and to hear it all at once you know that was that was really great. Um, my my first experience was similar I think to Lauren's. Um, I remember I read a blog article on how the mainframe works and like the different basic parts of it like the first week that I started at Broadcom and. Uh, <laughs> it reminded me of my like intro to computer science courses, you know, telling you about all the different parts of the computer and how they interact and all this stuff. And um, I would I would say honestly, the modern tools are much better because it didn't take me very long to start contributing, even though I really don't know that much. And I really leaned on Jesse Lane on Jelly a lot to you know test my stuff and even understand like what it was or how it was that I could test it. Um, but it was it was definitely a learning experience, and it's kind of cool to see how things have been done almost from the beginning of computers. So. I'm interested, Billy, in what you said earlier about your part of the beta beta project uh, that first worked on, on Zoe. I wonder what that means, like the first steps of connecting mainframe with open source and what, what that entails. When I first um, joined up with IBM, I knew nothing about mainframes. I was fresh out of college. Um, and I came in and there really wasn't even a team built. I was the first member and I was here by myself for about a month, month and a half with really no team to work with. And so when I found out I was put into mainframes and working with Z systems, I just kind of crammed a bunch of education in and, you know, joined the meetings for the initial Zoe team back when it was beta and it was really interesting you know trying to learn all that and trying to set zoe up on my own not knowing anything about mainframes and trying to get it installed and work with it and th this isn't zoe explorer this is pre-zoe explorer so this was you know the the browser-based zoe installed on the zos and it was really wild and you know joining all those meetings that Alvin Tan was running and you had Joe Winchester and Colin Stone and all of the first you know when they were first talking about okay we're gonna 
we're going to build this new product that makes it easier for people fresh out of college to adapt and work with mainframes. And I thought it was really cool that I was, you know, kind of a part of that as it was first starting out. And I'm more of a back end developer, so I'm used to the terminal. So working with the 3270 emulator, it, it was a little different because it's not, you know, it's not the same commands as a terminal and stuff like that. So you had to learn all the new commands for TSO and everything. But it was very interesting and I enjoy it. So from that, I've been picking up more education for system administration and stuff like that. That's great. For me, it's it's a totally different experience because I came from a mainframe background. And to me, putting mainframe and open source in the same sentence wasn't really, it wasn't heard of. So my experience with Zoe is, is totally different. And I was excited because I, in with my background as a mainframer, I was very interested in how I could have used it when I was still a COBOL developer, an application developer for RAM. So that's my my journey to Zoic Sport. But now let's maybe let's dive deeper into what that means. We've mentioned Zoe a lot, but let's maybe um, define it a bit more. So I would like to ask Jelly. I'd like to ask Jelly to give us a, an overview about the, the project. Sure. Um, Zoe is a modern open source interface for the mainframe. It is hosted by Linux Foundation's Open Mainframe Project, we call that OMP, and it's the first open source project based on ZOS. And the initial contribu contributors for this um, came from Broadcom, IBM, and Rocket Software. It has five components, as you can see here on the slide. It has a command line interface. It has an API mediation layer that serves as your portal for all of your web services. It has an IDE extension or a VS Code extension, which is we are part of that squad. And it also has a web UI component where you are allowed to have a web desktop browser. And it has a software developer kit. Um, software development kit and this kit allows you to extend all of these four components and create your own plugin so you can create your own CLI plugin your API mediation layer instance your VS code extension and as well as a plugin in the web desktop Zoe opens mainframe securely to enterprise DevOps it builds community around mainframe DevOps and it makes mainframe an exciting career choice and today, um, Zoe has a big community, and we are all collaborating and helping each other through Slack. Exactly. I think let's let's talk about that the mainframe community, and within the Zoe Open community. So let's talk about collaborating within that. So how would Jelly? Let's start with you. How would you define that collaboration? I think that collaboration for me is really great. Um, they are very friendly, you know. The, they're very friendly. They're very helpful, especially our squad. I'm very proud of our squad. You know, we are very friendly. We want to help people to discover what Zoe really means and how can you integrate all of these open source tooling um, to mainframe. And so we, in our community, uh, we write blogs. We, we connect to these to, to our users um, in collaboration with o master the mainframe and also the open mainframe projects cobalt programming course we are providing support for our students you know so that they could have a better experience while using Zoe Explorer as well as the extensions built on top of Zoe Explorer which is the FTP or the Kix um, even our internal let's say own project or our own VS Code extension, we are also providing support for that. So I do love our collaboration and our community because it's it's a very, let's say, collaborative experience. Lauren, do you see any pros and cons to the, the collaboration that you mentioned um, that the Zoe community consists of different companies? So do you see like any pros and cons in, uh, in the experience? Sure. So, um, like Jelly mentioned, our particular 
<clears throat> excuse me, our particular community in Zoe and the Zoe Explorer Squad. I found it very welcoming um, because as I said before, Zoe Explorer is my first open source project. And I was kind of intimidated by it at first because you know I, I hadn't worked on it before or any other open source project. So when I ever had heard about these, you know, open source during my classes or during hackathons or whatever, it always sounded like a very individual endeavor. Like you would sit in your corner, you'd program and you'd make your um, pull request and, and you know, you would just hope that somebody pays attention to you. Um, but when I joined Zoe, I found that um, it's, as Jelly has been saying, it's a very welcoming community. And, um, and I was really surprised by how organized it is and how, how much there is a community. <laughs> so, you know, it's not just people sitting in a corner programming. You've got, you know, squads for each component. We are the Zoe Explorer squad. Um, and we have squad scrum meetings, you know, that are actually people getting together on a Zoom call and talking through issues together and, and pull requests together. Um, and for me, that's been very engaging and very encouraging. Um, and I think that really helps keep Zoe, the community, and also the products itself, um, you know, very active. So um, that's the pros. Um, as for cons, I don't really see any that are really specific to Zoe. I think, you know, we do have people from different companies, and sometimes you have, like, um, you know, different companies may have different interests or different directions they may want to take Zoe or Zoe Explorer. Um, but I don't think these um, differences are, you know, they don't cause more problems for Zoe or Zoe Explorer than you would see in a different open source project that also is collaborated on by different companies. So, um, you know, the, you just to resolve the issues, you know, you kind of just think at the core what benefits the community as a whole, not just the company, but, you know, the your users that you're developing for and the wider Zoe community. Um, and I think going back to that core vision or shared value helps kind of smooth over those differences that we may have, even though we come from different companies. Well said, thanks. Caitlin, what about you? How was your experience with this open community of Zoe? Uh, I would say it's quite similar to uh, what the others said. I will say I learned a lot at Broadcom and uh, I really liked how friendly the community was. You know, it's a lot different from going to Stack Exchange and asking a question and have everyone bark at you. It, it was really friendly. And I mean, coming from somebody who doesn't know much about mainframe, I didn't feel like I was asking stupid questions, although I was definitely afraid when I started, like, okay, I shouldn't ask something that would be stupid, but, uh, you know, everybody on the team is really friendly and willing to explain things and patient, and I think maybe part of that also comes from the master of the mainframe, that people do ask questions, and Jelly and Rochelle are, you know, there to answer and to help out, so that was really nice. Um, I liked how fast things went. So, um, you know, you, you open a pull request and you're going to get a review within the week. I mean, unless, unless we're like right about to release the next version, you're going to get a review almost right away. So that was, that was really nice to get feedback very quickly. Um, cons, yes, as Lauren said, there were sometimes some priority differences based on, you know, which company you came from. And sometimes it would be hard to work on Zoe Explorer because you had other priorities, you know, for, for whichever company you worked for. Um, but I think, I think that was, that was mostly it. I remember, I remember there were some problems with the meeting times that it kept waffling. It wasn't really a problem, but it kept waffling between, you know, because, uh, the American group or the American team wanted it to be, what was it? I guess, I guess later and the European team wanted it to be earlier so that it wasn't right at five. <laughs> but if, as far as problems go, that's pretty minor. It was just kind of, you know, funny at the time. Yeah, it's it's just about the communication, I think. So Billy, how about you? How was your experience? And did, do you feel like the community has a passion for mainframe modernization, like as a Zoe community itself? Yes, I think there is a passion for the mainframe, and that's what really drives all the community um, collaboration and everything. I do agree about you know maybe a con on 
you know, the companies with their own processes and everything. But that's the best thing about the open community squads and everything. You don't go one way or the other with the processes. We decide together how we'd like to go. We may even create a whole new process. So that that it stands alone and isn't just like the separate community, the separate companies that are all aligned with the project. I, I think in my opinion, it really boils down with just communication, you know, whether or not like different companies have different priorities. If you communicate with each other, you will find the middle ground. And what Billy said, you're gonna go through that middle ground so that all of you will will come will benefit from that. I would also like to add, uh yeah, for sure, communication definitely helps. And speaking of communication, I remember that it was sometimes difficult to get feedback on our products from customers. So if you're using our products, please tell us <laughs> what you think. It'd be super useful. <laughs> Definitely. And yeah, for me as well, I think the, the common theme is all of the squads, especially during our program increment plannings, I, I feel like in the community itself, everyone is working towards mainframe modernization and making that that better that transition from the legacy and old style of working with the mainframe with the new ones i think it's i, I really feel that um, in the passion so so now let's go to the section on how zoe explorer contributes to that to to, mo to mainframe modernization and i would like to ask lauren to describe the user experience in, in zoe explorer sure so as Jelly had explained earlier in her slides, Zoe Explorer is a Visual Studio Code or VS Code extension, and it allows the developers and mainframe system administrators to interact with their mainframe resources using a local graphical user interface, which is uh, you know the embedding in VS Code. And this is a really big difference from the traditional, more text-based 3270 emulator also known as the green screen, um, which has a much deeper learning curve, as I had mentioned before. So for Zoe Explorer, we really want to make interacting with the mainframe more intuitive by placing these mainframe interactions into the more user-friendly tree browser in the VS Code views um, inside the Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. For Zoe as an organization, one of its main goals is to make getting started with mainframe development um, easier, more familiar, simpler, and more attractive to developers. And because many of today's developers tend to be more familiar with the graphical user interfaces of popular IDEs like VS Code, which happens to be one of the most popular IDEs out there, um, Zoe Explorer is a really great tool for these developers to jump into the world of mainframe development. Sounds like a great product. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So now let's move to Caitlin and ask, I would like to ask you, Caitlin, to explain how the Zoe Explorer squad communication works and in your experience, what, what that looks like. Yes, ma'am. Usually, let's talk about it from like a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week perspective. Um, we would usually have one meeting every day or one meeting every other day, you know, stand up to talk about, you know, what we've been working on. And basically, we talk about all of the uh, pull requests that we had open at that time. So all of the all of the squad chat is is on Slack, and also it makes it really easy to communicate with the mainframe community, especially the master of the mainframe people, because they also are uh, communicating with us on Slack. And um, yeah, it was it was really open. I would say that communication happened whenever you wanted it to. You could communicate with the entire squad at once, or you could communicate with one or two or, you know, however many people were interested in some issue that you were talking about. Yep. Thank you, Caitlin. It, Billy, do you feel like there's a positive culture in the squad, even though we come from different companies? Oh, definitely. Everybody's very respectful of each other and open to hear each other's ideas and collaborate on that and we all learn from each other and share our knowledge so yes i i really think the squad has a very good um feel about it so 
you know, when I first joined, I'm probably what the newest member of the squad on the call here. I've been with the Zoe Explorer, what, maybe a year, year and a half now. And, you know, like Lauren mentioned earlier, you know, going into open source could be a little intimidating. But, you know, once I got into the calls and got working on the project and everything, it, it really, it, it was really smooth transition in and I felt very welcoming. That's good to hear. Both you, Lauren, um, how do you manage internal priorities and contributing to open source, like in terms of balancing that, that work? So a lot of this is um, making sure that Zoe Explorer is like a robust product that we can build upon. Um, Zoe Explorer is extensible, like Jelly was saying uh, during her overview of Zoe. And so you want to make sure that as a base product, it's strong and um, you know it caters to the needs of its users. So even though your internal commitments might be different or they might want to take Zoe Explorer in a certain direction, you have to kind of make sure that the basic the basics are covered um, regarding things like you know your user experience. You want to make sure that's good for everybody. You know nobody's going to benefit if a company takes it in a direction where the user experience is bad. So you want to make sure you know keep the user in mind at the forefront and um, making sure that you communicate again. Um, within your squad or you know with the Zoe Explorer squad and that really helps kind of balance the priorities between your internal commitments and the more you know open source ones is kind of um yeah just making sure that you're um you're putting the user first and making sure that Zoe Explorer is just a strong um extension that other, you know, whether it's IBM or Broadcom, other companies can build upon. Yeah, it's about a good user experience and, and not just for new new mainframers, but also for right. for experienced mainframers who want to be more efficient in, in their work. I think it's it's yeah. definitely a good direction to go. So I want to go to Jelly and you mentioned earlier connecting with with Billy when she first joined the squad and connecting to Lauren when she first joined the squad do you think that these connections you made with with these other women in the squad help you to have healthier debates in whether we, we we agree on a certain direction I think so I think really communication is the key to to all of these things and I think one of one of the great things that we have, at least for what we've been trying to say, is that we have one goal, and that is to provide the best user experience for our users. And having that mindset and having the, the ability to communicate to each other and explain our goals, then we are able to, let's say, form objectives that is beneficial for for all of us um i remember when ibm started um joining our group and contributing a lot more um they were thinking about extensibility and i i truly love that idea because in for me personally i don't know how to do it and so when billy and lauren started refactoring our code organizing it making it easier for us developers to read it and then they provided this API so that others can create their extensions on top of Zoe Explorer. I think that's a really great move. That's a really great features because now not just vendors, um, mainframe vendors, mainframe users, and even individual contributors can now create their own extensions on top of Zoe Explorer. So if let's say I want some feature that nobody wants to create, I could create my own, you know. And this kind of let's say communication to different companies, different people, um, and having that one mindset still, it's 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 the important key to to have this great user experience um, implemented in Zoe or Zoe Explorer in general. Yeah. Um, Rochelle, I don't know if you wanted to add your thoughts. I just have one more thing to add before we switch slides. 
Go ahead. Um, I just, I just want to say, you know, working there, it was super easy to collaborate with other people. And it was really nice because I felt like I learned quite a lot just by, you know, some issue would come up and it was related to, I don't know, CICD or it was related to tests or it was related to uh, building, building some larger part of the product like, like profiles. And maybe I didn't work on that by myself, but even just getting the opportunity to try and to work on it with other more senior programmers in a certain area, it was a really great learning experience. And I really got to try just about everything that I wanted to try. So there wasn't, there wasn't any limitation like, oh, you don't know enough about that. So we're going to choose somebody else who can do it faster and you just work on what you know. It was, it was really great to be able to just sort of spread out and be like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in CICD this week. So I'm going to, I'm going to try that. I totally agree with that. And um, having the, you know, the, everybody with the different backgrounds and everything, when we did have these discussions, you've got multiple perspectives and ideas. And, you know, it was really great to collaborate those ideas and find a, a good solution that you may not have thought about on your own. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yep. 100% I, I agree. I, I'm a Cobol developer. I don't know how to code in TypeScript. And when I joined the squad, I learned how to do it. So it's really, really helpful. I learned a lot as well. Yeah, I think our squad really embraced our, our diversity and not just, you know, in terms of geography, in terms of gender, in terms of all these other things, but even our, our experiences, whether if it's distributed, back and front and um, mainframe, I think it's the, the lesson there is to, to embrace that. It's it's a strength and, and not a weakness. So I think like we can move to the next topic, which is representation in the broader Zoe community. So our panelists, four out of five are, um, represented in the in the Zoe community leadership. So I would like to ask Billy to explain what, what that means, what that entails. Sure, thanks Rochelle. Um, I myself am the Zoe Explorer Technical Steering Committee representative and the Zoe community believes in transparent and open implementation of processes and deliveries. They say, they like to say open first developing transparently with an inclusive environment where anyone willing can easily find a way to participate and contribute. So with this in mind, all status updates, squad meetings, and demos of progress are open to the public. The Zoe community is stakeholder centric, where stakeholders include end users, exploiters, Deploying Enterprises, or the Zoe Advisory Council. The Zoe community used stakeholder feedback when planning future work during our PI planning and iterations, and we keep them informed on how the feedback is received and responded to. Lauren is our Zoe Explorer Security Group representative, and this group deals with the security issues raised and coordinate remediation of the vulnerabilities with the affected squad or squads. Thank you. So I want to ask the about your RTSC representative for, for Zoe Explorer. I wonder if you've encountered any barriers in in, in you feeling confident about you know decision making as, as part of, of that group for, for our squad. I'm really new to the um, position and being our representative. It has been interesting. You know, I joined the weekly calls and I've brought up, you know, a few questions and stuff we would like to get insight in. So, you know, especially when it is in regards to our Zoe Explore extenders and then just, you know, keeping our community statuses up to date with our committers and everything because you know the OMP community um, presents badges to Zoe committed committers that they can use you know they can have those badges on their LinkedIn accounts um, 
it'll show that they had this experience with the open community and with the you know modernization of the mainframes and helping out there and been to a few of the other calls you know the architectural call and got some feedback there and it's been a lot of fun talking with all the other representatives from the squads and listening to what they want to share and how the progress on their products are going as well. Lauren, can you talk about your experience with the security work group? Sure. So um, as like Billy, I'm also quite new to this position. And in fact, uh, we are, the, the security work group is kind of evolving right now. So we are hoping to make our practices for security more robust, um, more transparent for our users. And um, so right now we're kind of gathering uh, perspectives from the different squads on, you know, how to handle security issues. Um, you know, what's uh, well, we just, we actually do do like scans on a regular basis for security issues, but um, we are trying to coordinate. You know, how how do we handle um, our process for approving a release? Um, what's our process for you know how how security is factored in? Like, how does the security squad? Um, communicate with, like, say, the technical steering committee to let them know whether or not they think a release is um, ready to go out in the perspective, um, from a security perspective. So that's what a lot of the work right now is, as well as also um, around um, trying to improve the way co we communicate how we do security at Zoe. Um, we were trying to improve the way we do that as well. It's good to hear. I think we, we've touched on this earlier, but making decisions and feeling confident about those decisions. I think it's easy if we know that it's it's about be, making things better for, for our users and, and for the community in general. I think it's, it's a good, good point. So in closing, I want each of our panelists to describe briefly what you think the future of mainframe development will look like. Let's start with Billy. Okay, um, the future of mainframe development, um, I believe it really depends on the feedback we get from our users and the people that are adopting our products and everything. That feedback really helps form that future. And, you know, they, they may be seeing issues or want enhancements or something that we haven't even thought of. So. If you feel like there's something missing, definitely let us know and we'll discuss it as a team and see how relevant that is and keep a conversation going about it. And I think that'll really like frame that the future development. Other than that, it's more of just, you know, making everything cleaner and work a little bit better, um, you know, just finalizing and getting stuff going like that. That's very hopeful. What about you, Caitlin? What do you think future of mainframe development will look like? Uh, I think that the open mainframe project is gonna play a big role. Um, just because, you know, as, a, as somebody coming into it, it definitely affected how I worked with mainframe and I'm doubtful that it will be easy to get enough mainframers into mainframe without it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not an experienced mainframer. I know that sometimes it can be hard to convince older members of the, of the community that it's, it's actually worthwhile to do this because they didn't need it and they were just fine. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, all of the reasons behind that, but I would say that from, from my perspective as a younger mainframer who's used to using Git and VS Code and using tools that sort of work with a mouse, for instance, or work from the command line and you don't have to use weird function keys to navigate around, uh, it's definitely been very helpful for me to use the modern mainframe and I, I honestly can't imagine using mainframe without it. So I, I really see that as, as the future that, that we're moving towards. 
let's go to a more experienced main fiber. Jelly, what's your perspective? So for me, as somebody who started with main fiber like for like 13 years, well maybe more 10 years using the 30 to 70 screen. I think really the, the future of mainframe, I, I, I agree with you, Tim. Open mainframe will ha will have a big role in this. And I do like that with our project, with the, with the Zoe Explorer, you know, I could use a mouse, I could use a right click to do this navigation and to connect with data sets and stuff. And so I, I think the future of more mainframe development is good and it's bright it's it's gonna be beautiful um if um a lot of people will try and use zoe i think that the modernization part is is quite let's say innovative in this way which is i i remember my manager said that it's very weird for him to hear mainframe and innovation together in as connected to each other. And with Zoe and Open Mainframe in the picture, those two things are something that's very possible. So I think it's a good feature. I, I'm, I'm seeing a good feature. That's why I'm an ambassador for Open Mainframe because I, I truly believe in this, in this project. And if I am going to use it as an experienced mainframe developer, I think it's very useful. Lauren, right, why don't you close us off? So I totally agree with what Billy, Caitlin, and Jess uh, Jelly said. Um, and because I come from a similar perspective as Caitlin, I will kind of um, hook into that and say that um, Zoe, because it's got these goals of trying to make the mainframe development more attractive to new people, um, it's going to be a big part of it. Like I agree with her on this just because we're kind of doing this outreach to people who might not usually be thinking about mainframe development. Um, and we're starting to kind of reach these uh, populations of developers that we, that, you know, maybe weren't, you know, weren't going to be part of the pool of people who would be contributing to mainframe development. So for things like Zoe Explorer, for example, I think that's really important. You know, we don't want to scare people away from mainframe development. The mainframe is really powerful and it's, um, you know, we need people to be able to maintain those programs that will keep them running and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So um, I think one indicator of this is the way that Zoe Explorer has been integrated into quite a few COBOL courses, at least three, um, Master the Mainframe being one of them. It's now called IBM Z. I think it's now called IBM Z Explore. Um, they changed their name, but um, essentially it's still using Zoe Explorer to get people into mainframe application development. And um, I think it's really important because, you know, when you start people on these tools and you start them on tools, you know, things that they're familiar with as a, as a jumping off point to get into the world of mainframe development, um, you know, once they become familiar with those tools, they start wanting to use them for their jobs. So, um, I think Zoe will play a big part of that. The Open Mainframe project will play a big part of that. And um, that'll be good for me because I still struggle with the 3270 emulator. So, um, you know, I, I like seeing it move in this more, in this direction that's more intuitive for, for me. And also, you know, our other users too. Thanks for, for all your thoughts. I think what, what, really stood out from from all of you what you said is that it's about always improving it's about always learning and that's true as well not just for for mainframe development but for com collaborating within a community and an open source uh, community at that so that's it for our panel discussion if you want to continue the conversation uh, these are links that you can go to to engage with us. All of us are active on Slack, as mentioned earlier. So if that's the best way and the quickest way to reach us and talk to us, all our Scrum meetings are open. So you just subscribe to the mailing list and you can join us and, and talk to us there as a squad as well. Our squad values feedback and the quickest way to give us your thoughts is to via our GitHub repository. You can open issues or submit bug reports. So finally, I want to thank you again, 
thank you, ladies, and um, thanks for the lively discussion. And I've I've learned and I've enjoyed learning from from all of you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Rochelle.